It's barely been a month since 20.1, but Blackmagic already has another minor dot release, 20.2. You know those are our favorite releases because they often bring improvements to the tools we're already using. Here's our roundup. Improvements have been made to track patching and ripple behavior. Some changes simply affect the UI, others impact functionality. We'll start small and work our way to the big stuff. Track destination is now called source selector. Its function remains the same, but the UI has received a small tweak. Selected tracks are now shown with a turquoise outline. As a reminder, this feature allows you to control how clips from the media pool get inserted into the timeline. It's especially useful when using a timeline as a source. String out timelines might contain multiple audio and video tracks that can't easily be patched with a simple drag and drop operation. Choosing not only what tracks you pull from the source, but what tracks in the destination timeline they are inserted into is very important when working in busy timelines. Remember that the functionality of the track destination controls, now called source track selector, has not changed. It's just a small UI tweak. On the other hand, auto track selectors UI and functionality have both changed. Instead of this old logo, this function is now toggled using this red icon that is directly next to the source track control. Given how important this function is, we appreciate the relocation of this control and the extra prominence that it has been given. Its function remains largely the same with one interesting exception. In past, Auto Track Selector affected ripple operations. There's now a separate control called Sync Lock represented by this icon. It's helpful to separate these two functions as ripple needs are often different from Auto Track Selection needs. While it was possible to work effectively with both functions rolled into a single control, it required more user interaction as you reconfigured the Auto Track Selector for different edit operations. There's one last improvement to discuss, and this is perhaps the most significant. In past ripple trim operations, it could be problematic when dealing with long clips. I'll start by demonstrating ripple behavior in 20.1. Track 1 contains dialogue and track 2 contains B-roll that has been carefully synced with track 1. When I perform a ripple operation on clips in track 2, the other clips in track 2 are rippled, but not the clip in track 1. That's because it's so long that it extends beyond the edit that I am ripple trimming. As a result, from this point onwards, the synchronization between the dialogue and B-roll has been lost. Now let's revisit that same problem in 20.2 and perform the same ripple edit. DaVinci Resolve now blades the underlying clip at the location of the trim edit and will either add a gap if extending the edit or remove a portion if trimming the edit. Now the dialogue will remain in perfect sync with the B-roll, making ripple editing in busy timelines much less dangerous. In some instances, you'll need to dedicate time to patching the gaps or jump cuts made in the underlying media. But on the whole, these cuts made to keep the media in sync are preferable to long clips losing sync with the rest of your media. If you'd like to revert to the old ripple trim behavior, there are two options. One, I can disable sync lock on the track that contains my B-roll, like that. Option number two, I can disable sync lock on the track that contains my dialogue, like this. In either case, the trim tool now behaves like it did in version 20.1. In different scenarios, you will find it easier to disable the track you're trimming or the track you want to protect. Both the UI redesign and the new sync lock behavior are welcome additions that will improve your editing experience. This video is sponsored by Audio, who we use for all the music you hear on our channel, including the track you're hearing right now. Audio's music is made by human beings like me and you, but they have a really cool suite of AI tools like Link Match or Hands that help with things like finding the right music. They've introduced a new feature, Elements 2.0, that provides studio quality stems of every single track in their library. If you like a song but don't want the vocals, or it is instrumental but it's a little bit too busy, that's not a problem. Download all the stems with a single click and remix the song in your NLE, choosing what elements you want to keep just like this. This feature is available in Audio's Pro subscription, which usually costs $200 a year, but with our discount code, you can get it all for a staggering $60. There's details in the description. This brand new Resolve FX simulates the effect of adding haze while shooting. Haze can add drama and can enhance audiences' appreciation of distance. The light from distant objects in a scene has to travel through more haze before it reaches the camera. As a result, the haze's effects are stronger on distant objects. So simulating haze requires Resolve to understand depth. Thus, unsurprisingly, the new cinematic haze effect makes use of the technology found in Depth Map version 2. In fact, Cinematic Haze incorporates features from several other existing FX that you might recognize as we break it down. Just like when using Depth Map, you can preview the mask, 
Changing the far limit, near limit or gamma will affect how deep the haze goes within the scene. For example, lowering the near limit will push the haze into the background of the scene. The entire suite of depth map controls is accessible by enabling advanced depth controls. I'm using the effect to simulate an early morning mist. They typically hover just above the ground, but do not extend to the sky. So I will combine the effect with a gradient. That's better. Atmospheric scattering controls the quality and type of haze. The primary control for affecting the intensity is air light. You'll notice that controls like resolution loss are affected by the air light property. When air light is set to zero, resolution loss has no effect. But as the air light parameter increases, the effect of the resolution loss becomes more apparent. Density further reduces the ability to see objects through the haze and affects contrast. Light halos and light rays are especially useful if you have bright light sources visible in the frame, like this street lamp. Halo allows you to add a glow to the bright light sources in the image. Light rays allows you to create shafts of light, again emanating from a light source in the image. As halos controls are similar to the glow effect and light rays are similar to the light rays effect, we won't cover them in detail in this video, but there is one thing that I'd like to point out. I've configured the halo threshold to capture just the bright lights in the scene and fine-tuned its size and brightness. I've also enabled the light rays, configured the same threshold to capture the same lights and created a shaft of light. Here's what I wanted to show you. The extent of the glow and light ray effects are both limited to the parts of the image where the haze is visible. That means they too are being affected by the depth map in the image. To highlight that point, I'll adjust the angle and length of the light rays so that it points towards Natalie. And check that out. The light ray doesn't go over her, it goes behind her. Because according to the way I have configured the depth map, that's where the haze in the scene is. It's all behind her. Let's configure the angle so that the lamp appears to be shining down on the street. Air disturbance allows us to add inconsistencies to the haze. We really like this preview influence checkbox as it allows you to focus on the haze while configuring the controls. By default, the air disturbance will move over time. That's controlled by things like seethe or flow direction. So if I wanted, I could have the mist blowing from left to right in this scene. Adding disturbance does introduce a small problem though. If the camera moves, the texture in the haze won't move with the camera, unless you track the camera's motion. Head to the tracking tab, switch to the FX tracker, I will use AI IntelliTrack, add a tracking point and position it over the street light because that's a really easy detail to track and then track back and forth. Now it's tracked, I can enable follow FX tracker and the air disturbance will move with the camera. Very cool. Here's one last example from the same sequence to show you how you can get really authentic results using this new effect. It was possible to create haze effects like this before, but they required you to combine several effects like depth map, fast noise, and light rays. Having it all rolled into a single effect saves time and aids creativity. There's already an incredible amount of metadata you can enter on clips in your media pool, but it's just got even better. You can now create your own custom fields. Open the metadata tab, click on the triple dot menu, and go to create custom metadata. You can choose a name, type of data, and even have your new custom metadata field persist across all the projects in your current project library. Once created, that custom metadata is visible in its own section. To manage your custom metadata fields, head back to the triple dot menu and select Manage Custom Data. We're looking forward to seeing how this feature develops further. A small but welcome improvement to the keyframe viewer and tray, you can now affect multiple parameters at the same time by holding down on Shift or Alt while clicking on their visibility or lock buttons. Holding Alt and clicking will enable just one parameter at a time. Holding Shift and clicking will disable or enable all of the parameters at the same time. Combining those new features with the existing ability to toggle individual parameters makes it easier to clean up the keyframe viewer with less clicks. Do you like using the trim editor? There's now a user option that automatically switches from dual viewers to a single viewer when you engage the trim editor tool. Now, when I open the trim editor, the screen looks like this. Our apologies that we didn't cover guides in the last release video. If you didn't know, the viewers now have guides, stuff snaps to them, and they are awesome. There's some improvements to guides in 20.2.
you can now specify the guide's location in pixels or a percentage. So for example, to get a guide in the middle of the screen, you don't need to do maths. You can now just type 50%. You can also lock them and you can even assign them different colors. Glow, light rays, lens reflections, and lens diffraction can now use a node's alpha input to define the source regions from which the effect is built. You'll see those new options under input alpha on each effect. Pushing C to move the playhead now works in the media and color page viewers. There's a nifty new way to navigate your timeline in the color page. This is a color page only feature. Head to playback, go to, and select clip number. Now simply type in the clip number that you want to go to. You can, of course, assign a hotkey to this function too. We think that's what most people will want to do. This makes me so happy. You can now access the current date and time when naming your renders or when building custom data burn-ins. Why is this so helpful? Here's an example. Over the course of a day, you might render several versions of your edit. If you wanted to keep track of them, you'd have to edit the render job and write the dates in manually every time you rendered. Now you can have Resolve automatically add the date as an on-screen burn-in or in the render file name. Start by typing the percent symbol. The date fields are listed under date. You'll notice that there are different date standards, or you can access day, month, and year separately. It's the same with time. You can choose a standard or access hours and minutes yourself. The procedure is the same when creating data burn-ins. Enable a custom field and type the percentage sign and find the metadata you want to insert. It's the small things, right? Thanks, Blackmagic. Here's another awesome feature. In version 20, Blackmagic added a feature to the Fairlight page that allows you to delete silent portions of audio. That feature has now been brought to the edit page, but with a twist. It doesn't just delete the audio, it also deletes the video too. It can be triggered by going to Clip, Audio Operations, Ripple Delete Silence. As always, a hotkey can be configured. It's brilliant for processing large clips filled with dialogue. You'll need to tweak the settings so it's not so sensitive that it cuts every single breath and moment of silence. The on-screen visualization is really helpful. With structured footage like interviews, depending on how it's mic'd, this tool could be used to break the clip down into individual statements. In the past, when exporting a DRT of a timeline, Resolve would include the media in the timeline and any fusion compositions in the timeline, but it would not include media from within the fusion compositions. That's now fixed. This makes sharing and archiving timelines that contain fusion comps substantially easier. There are two small improvements that have been made to multi-text. In the Layout tab, there are new Align controls. This allows you to align text elements to the frame boundary or safe margins. But of course, many people might still prefer to snap text elements to guides in the viewer, like this. And in the Page tab, there is a new position and size control. This acts like the size and position controls found in the Transform Inspector settings, but this control is integrated directly into the multi-text effect. There's also two small immersive updates in this release. It's now possible to stream to an Apple Vision Pro from the Fusion page. We're so glad to see this. Just like before, streaming is triggered through the Stream to Vision OS menu. In Fusion, the Panomap tool could be used to convert images between different 180 and 360 formats. Panomap now supports Immersive, making it possible to reproject immersive images into formats like Latlong and vice versa. There's a bunch of other improvements too, like improved Magic Mask caching in Fusion, faster transcription and voice conversion in Mac OS, automation in the Fairlight page now ripples and follows the edit when deleting gaps or clips, the 3D renderer in Fusion can now produce multiple render passes in layers, speed changes made to multicam clips are now preserved when flattening the clip to the timeline, and much more. As always, we highly recommend going and watching the update videos from other creators like Darren Moston, Mr. Alex Tech, Patrick Sterling, Frenchy Color, and others. What was your favorite improvement? Let us know down in the comments. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like, share it with your friends, and consider subscribing so you don't miss out on future videos. Thank you to Audio, as always, for supporting our channel. And lastly, but most importantly, thank you for watching.